So, continuing the assessment with my boy Steven here. Um, it's all important to find out what the movement mechanics for a push pattern, a pull pattern, a walk, a lunges. But we have to kind of understand what's going on with the whole kinetic chain or the whole body. So the best way to really look at that is to actually analyze the feet and the ankles. Okay, like I said, this assessment that you do with me is very thorough. You literally want to pinpoint where there may be compound issues going on throughout the body so we don't just treat one area and expect that to get better when there could be something originating somewhere else. Okay, so this test is really profound and super important and it's going to be the foot and ankle test. I'm going to actually get you to slip off your shoes and this is optional. You can also slip off your socks so we can really look at the capabilities of your toes. It's totally up to you. So what we're gonna get you to do is we're gonna just look at analyzing just the toe capabilities and the toe mobility off the hop. Uh, I'm gonna get you to see if you can just move your toes for me. Now can you move them individually or that you can kind of move as a unit? Kind of almost as a unit, yes? Yeah, okay, can you splay them out from one another? Ish, yeah, ish. So it happens a little bit with some of his feet, some of his toes, but not necessarily certain other ones, like especially this one, it just kind of sits there, right? Now what I'm gonna get you to do is you're gonna flex just your toes down towards the ground, not necessarily your ankle joint. Just you're going a little bit through the ankles, just literally flex the toes a bit. Then I'll get you to flex the toes up towards your face. Okay, I'll get you to flex the toes down, flex the toes up towards your face. And I'm actually gonna get you to turn a little bit to the side here, because this next test is gonna be profound for everybody to see. All right, so if you're looking at his toe capabilities, it's there, but there's some limitations, right? You probably felt a little bit of cramping or a little bit of tightness in certain areas, particularly when you needed to splay the toes away from one another, and you needed to almost recruit what we call, uh, we'll actually go through this next after we do the uh, ankle joint, so I'll go through that when we do the ankle joint. Let's do that now. So, I'm gonna get you to flex now just your ankles, and I'm gonna get you to flex your ankles down as far away from your face as possible. Excellent. Now I'm gonna get you to flex your ankles up towards your face, okay? Get you to flex your ankles down, away. Flex your ankles up. One more time for me, and we're gonna put this in perspective. So go ahead and flex down. Go ahead, flex up. All right, so he's actually pretty good, but essentially your ankle joint should probably be almost about here, and then your feet should be about there, okay? What we were testing is what I was just talking about, which is the ability to create dorsiflexion, which is super imperative and super important for loading the body evenly. If I can recruit a very healthy range of motion for my dorsiflexion, I can now recruit all this posterior chain activation throughout the whole body. What we see typically is people suffering from uh, more aggressive bouts than what he's suffering from, or what I like to call boot syndrome. The body stays at a 90 degree, the foot and the ankle joint stay at a 90 degree, and they won't necessarily get any farther. So you can imagine why when you go to add impacts, such as running, lunging, change in direction, you are unable to stay away from overloading the knees or overloading the calves or overloading you know, your groin area or your hips because you're not necessarily recruiting that muscle reaction or that muscle activation in the posterior chain. So this is super important. This is stuff that we go through when it comes to warm-ups when I first start with people. And this is stuff that I'll build every single program with is the appreciation for creating a healthier environment or a healthy situation for these particular muscle groups here that start your kinetic chain or start that impact on the ground, okay? So he has to do a lot of dorsiflexion or recruitment drills, but he would do that after kind of uh, reducing some stress or inflammation or tightness there. Because if I grab into Steven's side component here, I don't feel very comfortable, yes? Yeah. Okay, so there's gonna be a trigger point here. There's a trigger point right behind the Achilles, and then he would probably look at releasing the lateral components of the set ankles and all the muscle tissues that attach into the calf. Now, we did a linear test. I'm gonna get you to finish off here with a global test, so we'll get you to look at rotation. Okay, now when you're rotating, don't rotate anything but your ankle joint, okay? You're not necessarily going to rotate your calf, per se. I just want you to focus on the ankle joint. You can choose one leg or both legs at the same time. Look at that rotation and try to build as far of a rotation as you can. And as you see, he gets pretty limited. He hits a wall, and then he has to kind of react through the rest of his body, okay? Now, can you imagine where he would be applying this type of mechanics? If he's squatting with a lot of weight, if he's deadlifting with a lot of weight, are you able to stop this from happening or does your body just simply react? Probably react, okay? So that's why this is super important. 
I don't want to have a huge load of weight on my back, in front of my body, and I'm squatting, and now my foot, my footprint, and the way my legs are designing or aligning themselves now switch on me. Okay, so this is super important. Again, this is where we start a lot of our moral principles. Okay, overall, yours isn't bad. There's a lot of people who have much worse. Where you typically see it, people who have to work for a long period of time and sit for a long period of time, or people who wear a work boot. Right, military. You're you're actually military, right? You're gonna find that it's literally made to stick you into that 90 degree position. You are unable to get that full fledged rotation. It's important that you're choosing the right footwear as well. Something that's very free that allows you to recruit proper gait patterns or proper mechanics. Like a shoe like this. Like I got a New Balance minimal shoe where I get a lot of bending or a lot of freedom. And he's got a very similar shoe in that crossfit shoe that he's wearing there so he gets some type of freedom the last thing you want to do is wear a shoe that has a very high box or very high cushioning element where you're literally like floating on the ground okay and you're unable to recruit that type of range of motion because you're going to be very proactive with the exercises that you're doing moving forward to improve dorsiflexion and improve gait mechanics okay those shoes that you see with the elaborate cushioning and uh, the stabilizers is essentially a band-aid and it doesn't really address the problem and that's when you end up with compound injuries So it's important that you're proactive with a lot of what you do and that's just essentially how we create programs moving forward. You're proactive in your warm-ups, you're proactive in some of the exercises to improve these mechanics because that's what's going to improve your movements overall. Cool? Okay, alright. So, you can put those back on. We're going to get into some deeper core tests now. Final stability test. I'm gonna make some notes and put an ankle test. So you are unable. To, you know how we're talking about uh, adhesions and the ability to splay it and get the feet proper. The ability to splay and get your feet out builds you an arc or builds you a footprint. People who don't typically rely on shoes that close off your toe box, that narrow out your toe box, and this is important, right? Like women wear what? Heels. Really closes in that toe box. Men wear a business shoe or a boot, can close off the toe box. You getting swelling here, getting this overreaction here, is the inability to create that splaying or create that space. So it's literally building up there. You can if you've probably had ankle injuries in the past, yes? Yeah, so this is a cumulative stress, and that's the thing. A lot of people may feel better, but they've never really fully rehabilitated something, so it can come back. And when something has happened, such as this, your mechanics change. And over time, if you don't address it, something else can compoundly become a problem. So that's why we're very proactive with what we do. We're talking particularly about this is a good chance of just not getting enough recruitment or global freedom of the ankle joint, because it's very rigid, right? It's moving very robotic, okay? So it's literally building into that area. It's like a calcifying thing. So we need to recruit more of that space. It's gonna help flush some of those problems. Could this drain your energy? Yeah. Could this change your mechanics? Absolutely, right? Like these are things that you really want to address that are very thorough, okay? Cool. So, next test we're gonna do is spinal stabilization test. These are deeper core tests, and we will actually use this line here that we have in front of us. And this exercise is called the bird dog, okay? What we're looking for is we're gonna place either side of your thumb on this, either side of your knee on here. When we go to create this movement, are you able to stay relatively flat when you separate your extremities from your midpoint, okay? If somebody's very poor in this, they're gonna react to some capacity, yes? Okay, so we're gonna see where you're at and we'll compare the two sides. One tip I'll give you is the same tip we had since we started this assessment and these are the tips that I give people moving forward. Pelvis is in a good position, I pull my shoulder blades in, I really wanna dig my feet in. That's gonna help me recruit more pelvis control. So prior to getting started, find those positions and then commit to extend, okay? Yeah, we'll use the line. So either side of your thumb will be on the line. Same with the left hand, yeah. 
either side of the knee. So I'm going to get you to place yourself right down the middle of the line. You're going to slide over a bit. Good. Now, again, tuck your pelvis forward, tuck the air, pull your shoulder blades back, and try to stay in this type of profile as you extend your leg and arm out away from one another. Go ahead and do that. Good. And then come back. Do this on the other side. Good. Keep going. Good. So for these last three reps, what I want you to really focus on is when you go to extend your extremities, and this happens a lot with people, he's very powerful in expressing a movement, but can he articulate and transition back in a very safe profile or a very same neutral profile? Not necessarily. This happens a lot with people. They lose the ability to create a neutral spine or create a neutral position when their extremities expand or abduct from their midpoint. What I'm going to ask you to try to do is when you go to extend, you're very like wanting to extend through your lower back. Fight that feeling. Keep your pelvis almost over engaged and then try to extend and don't try to lose this profile when you extend. And if you have to stop there, stop there. Don't over extend. Go ahead and extend to stop there. Probably that's it. Now you're more flat. You're not extending, right? Okay, now bring it back in. Try the other side. I think I'm still tucking that pelvis forward. Better. Okay, so now it's staying more organized or it stays more in that same position. Turn the thumb toward the ceiling. Okay. Helps retract the shoulder blade. Good. You can stop. So if we were to mark that or we were to test that, overall Steven has very good power expressing away from his body but when he needs to articulate or bring that back in his spinal column is not stable this could put us at risk for what if i'm jumping and changing directions and i need to land if i'm throwing something if i'm throwing something like olympic lifts and stuff like that i don't know how to create that hollow neutral position and i literally will react because i have so much extremity power not deeper core presence or deeper core neutrality or core uh, activation it keeps my Final column in a stable position, you have to react through that process. Okay? It is probably a reason why you most recently had a little bit of an issue there. Like you kind of herniated something, that could be part of it. Okay? It was an accumulation of dysfunctional mechanics or dysfunctional activation. That's what we talk about, that's why it's important to do the assessment. Okay? Alright, so that's the spinal stability uh, test for the bird dog. The next one we're gonna do is everybody's favorite, and that's the plank. Okay, so let's look at that. I'm going to show you what a good plank should look like. We'll see if you can create that. Now, Steven doing her case. My guess is he'll be really good at this. Uh, but we're going to put this in perspective again. Okay? So if I was to get into a plank. A good plank involves us being anatomically sound. That means I don't bring my hands together. Why? That's going to pull my shoulder blades in that fixed position. Now I'm using my chest and my shoulders and my neck to keep me up. Where I should really be recruiting this feeling throughout my whole body. Particularly a lot through the core. So I'm not going to place my hands together. I'm actually going to keep them anatomically sound. Okay? We're talking about head position. That matters. I'm not dipping it. I'm also not tilting it. I'm retracting. All the blades are in. I'm keeping my ankle joint together, knee joint together. My pelvis is in a good position. And my shoulder blades kind of creep in. And I sit into that type of prone butt. This is, again, another spinal stability or a deeper core test. Go ahead and try that. Okay? Now, what I'm going to get you to try to do is tuck your chin a bit. And when you're thinking you're tucking your chin, you're literally pulling it back. Good. Yeah, even tuck your chin a little more. Yeah, right there. Now, you're dipping a lot through your lower back, so try to pull your, your hips forward to pump the air. Okay? But try not to overextend here, so you got to pull your shoulder blades together. Okay? But you're losing this, so you got to pull that back in. Let's try to bring that up. I want you to stop completely. I use this exercise for perspective more than anything. Okay? Everybody's so concerned or everybody's so uh, convinced that a plank, per se, can now give you what you're looking for, which is spinal stability and the ability to create that neutral position. You are a very good athlete, you've been working out your whole life, but if we look at that particular position, you're unable to create that hollow position where I'm here and I'm not getting that excessive bend. Okay? If I'm dealing with a body that's giving me some negative feedback, such as inflammation, I've had pain or injuries, Okay? My tissues are tight. We've already established that with some of the other assessment components and protocols. We touched areas and you're feeling rather tight. Why would I put myself in a tight fixed position or an isometric hold? 
if my goal is to create more mobility, understand how to articulate or weight distribute better, reduce pain and inflammation, and just feel like I have more energy, why would I not do a fixed position that I'm just not simply accelerating it? So how good is a plank overall? Not necessarily good, right? Like in rare cases, I will use a plank if somebody's herniated something. They've had a hip injury and literally dynamic movement can cause some type of bad feedback where the hip literally falls out or something like that. They had a head injury and putting things together can be very difficult for them to process. But overall, we want to stay out of kind of aggressive isometric hold at the forefront or at the beginning of the program, okay? Could we use a posture such as a plank to induce some type of thing that we're going for, such as learning how to articulate or keep the hip in a neutral position, learning how to activate here and garner the right retraction but the right neutral position in the shoulder blade, or sorry, the hip, absolutely. One of the first exercises out of the first program I like to use is a half plank with a knee drive, okay, where I'm still learning those dynamics, but this is actually something I can accomplish as opposed to this, and then getting this and then starting to try to move there. Okay, I'm not really recruiting anything, not teaching me anything of those principles. So we use certain particular postures or certain particular positions to induce some type of mobility or some type of activation or change. We will not necessarily use isometric cold off the hop. It's something that you actually need to stay away from because you're so tight and restricted in areas. Introducing more tight and restrictive components is not going to make it any better. You have to reduce that and actually add in more mobility. So that's something I use in perspective. Planks overall are okay, but only in certain instances, and I don't think they're really good at the beginning of the program. I think it's more important to kind of include the dynamics of mobility, weight distribution, and activation, okay? and getting your posture aligned. You're not going to get it through a plank. If anything, you're just going to get frustrated. Okay?